Thanks, thanks very much. Um, firstly, thank you for the invitation, invitation to come and speak here at this wonderful conference. Uh, so it might be joked that uh, populism is simply the democracy that liberals don't like, but I'm going to suggest that it's worse than that for the liberal, which is that populism is the democracy that liberalism has created or indeed laid the conditions for. So the title of the talk is Authoritarian Liberalism and Authoritarian Populism, Opposition or Inflection. And I should say that I'm talking about liberalism uh, largely uh, in its economic variety, its economic uh, liberalism. Economic liberalism both as the concrete and ideological form taken by modern capitalism. By way of introduction, uh, I would say then that it's a deeper phenomenon than is commonly associated with the label neoliberalism. And part of, my, part of the, um, the goal of my talk is to explain those deeper, deeper roots. Now, in terms of the question that I ask, uh, opposition uh, or inflection, I'm trying to get a sense of the relationship between these two phenomena. Most of my talk will concentrate on explaining authoritarian liberalism. And my conclusion, as you can guess by the title, is tentative as to the precise relation. But I'm inclined to, uh, to conclude that authoritarian populism is merely an inflection of authoritarian liberalism rather than an opposition. There is certainly a rhetorical opposition to liberalism within uh, the populist discourse, but there is not a rupture from the existing regime of the dominant regime of uh, authoritarian liberalism, particularly in the case of right-wing populism. Okay, so um, my... Sorry, how do I get to the next slide? Down? down? Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying. Um, okay. okay, maybe I didn't press it hard enough. Is it just very slow? Okay. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling with this technology, I'm afraid. Um, um. Not working. I can, use, I can just use it like this, maybe this. Okay, it's, it is very weird. Maybe just keep it as the, 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 the smallest screen, like this, and then would it work like that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, no, it's fine. It's fine. We can keep it like this. So I'm just going to read the, the abstract um, of the paper. Authoritarian populism often presented in opposition to the liberal international order in general and the European Union in particular is, on the contrary, a symptom or inflection of this order, purporting but failing to fill in the void that the liberal political order has created and maintained in its own authoritarian fashion. The relationship between authoritarian populism and authoritarian liberalism is therefore less one of antagonism than of mutual dependence. Now I'm going to focus very much on the particular case of Western Europe and the European Union. Um, I won't talk about the global order. Um, uh, I think that's been covered to some extent already in the previous presentation. Now, the term authoritarian liberalism first came to me um, in the height of the Euro crisis when I was asked to write a, an analysis uh, for the German Law Journal on the response to the Euro crisis. And it struck me that there were two, two things occurring in conjunction, in this conjuncture. Of course, the idea of the conjuncture is, the, is a, a Marxist term to capture uh, a period when conflicting forces are uh, coming together to create a crisis, but without a resolution. And the two um, uh, combination of forces which struck me as particularly evident through the Euro crisis was this combination of political authoritarianism, both in the terms of a, to put it colloquially, a kind of trashing of democracy, um, but also a delegalization of the treaties, in particular through the uh, actions of the European Central Bank. This is uh, Mario Draghi. Um, 
um, uh, his speech in uh, 2012, the do whatever it takes to, sort, to rescue the Euro speech, implicitly meaning bypassing some of the constitutional guarantees, and of course that came to uh, challenges in domestic constitutional court, particularly the German constitutional court, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker stating what, from a formal point of view, is only a, an obvious truth, that there can be no democratic choice against the European treaties. This, of course, in the bottom is the, uh, the, the, the this is a coup hashtag which went around um, um, when the uh, uh, Greek government of Alexis Tsipras was negotiating with the Troika and Tsipras uh, ultimately uh, capitulated. The, the first sign of um, a failure of, 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 of left-wing populism to rupture from the status quo. This is Macron at the top, the, the Jupiterian president who, uh, executive concentration of uh, signifying this concentration of executive powers in this moment and on the far right uh, a, a suggestion in this tweet battle between Donald Tusk and Yanis Varoufakis that actually the crisis was based on a much deeper problem in Varoufakis's uh, response to Tusk the very construction of EMU itself and uh, D Donald Tusk says I've been wondering what the special place in hell looks like for those who promoted Brexit without even a sketch of a plan how to carry it out safely. And then uh, Varoufakis responds, probably very similar to the place reserved for those who designed a monetary union without a proper banking union and once the banking crisis hit, transferred cynically the bankers' gigantic losses onto the shoulders of the weakest taxpayers. Now I think actually Varoufakis is only partly correct, I think, as I'm going to explain, that the conjuncture, the symptoms that came to a head in the conjuncture are symptoms of a, a, a much deeper set of um, pressures, constraints on democracy, which precede uh, uh, EMU uh, and, in, and indeed emerge uh, from the post-war period. So we have to move from the conjuncture to the long uh, durée, and this suggests that authoritarian liberalism, although heightened, in the Euro crisis, both in terms of de-democratization but also de-legalization, is, is present in a softer form already in the post-war reconstruction of the European order, paradigmatically in the case of West Germany, but which represents a, a, a bigger uh, phenomenon. Why? Because we can already see in post-war reconstruction the continuation of modes of hierarchy, political, social, economic, the separation of the fears, the differentiation, if we want to use the term, between politics and the, uh, econ uh, and the economy, in, in, in particular the depoliticization of the economy with the turn to technocratic rationality, managerialism, juristocracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In other words, authoritarian liberalism is not merely the exceptional moment not merely a violation of a, of a previous norm of liberal, well-functioning liberal democracy, but the norm itself, which suggests in turn that authoritarian populism is merely an, an inflection rather than a rupture from the norm. To conclude, I will say that the rupture, I mean, I conclude with a question, but that rupture would require not merely a break from neoliberalism, but from post-war liberalism itself, which is why it's a tough call, as it were. And, and don't, people generally don't want to grasp it by the, by the, by the balls. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> okay. So, I just did. Right. So, where do we begin? We begin in the 1930s, as I think so many commentators are acknowledging uh, uh, to understand this present conjuncture. And of course, the term authoritarian liberalism, I say of course, but I'm not sure how well known this is, but in uh, 1932, Hermann Heller, the German uh, social democrat and constitutional theorist, uses the term authoritarian liberalism to capture the cabinets of barons, as they're sometimes referred to, ruling late Weimar, just before the Nazis seized power in, 19, in January 1933, attempting at that stage to maintain the order of economic liberalism and capitalism at all costs, both from the right and the left. Um, and Heller, uh, a social democrat, but not on the, on the left wing of the SDP, more of a, of, a, of, a, of a centrist at the time, uses this label authoritarian liberalism pejoratively to criticize 
the ruling cabals of Weimar, ruling the, uh, the, the, the system through decrees, diktats, presidential authoritarianism, bypassing parliament to impose austerity. Uh, this is a quote from uh, an article uh, I wrote, which was a special issue of the European Journal, uh, European Law Journal, including a translation of Heller's article, Authoritarian Liberalism, into English for the first time. Heller uses the term authoritarian liberalism pejoratively, attacking it as an opportunistic position which justified a strong state in order to manage and maintain a liberal market economy and the capitalist interests that sustained it, subsidizing large banks and industry with one hand and dismantling social policy with the other. In other words, classic austerity uh, measures. Okay, now to understand the conjuncture of Weimar, of late Weimar, in the context of the broader debates of the time, we can expand the story to a deeper crisis, which of course Karl Polanyi elaborates on, in, 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 in not just in the European context, but indeed in a global context, but focusing on the interwar period as a crisis of the liberal democratic state of the long 19th century. In other words, that begins with the French Revolution and ends with uh, the, the, the First World War. Now, the, th the three dominant theorists, the jurists, at least, of Weimar, Hans Kelsen, uh, Hermann Heller, and Carl Schmitt, adopted different positions on how to handle the tensions that were being posed to the liberal order, the Weimar Constitution, which was a compromised constitution between uh, center-left and center-right forces. Uh, Hans Kelsen, the uh, legal philosopher and, and Democrat, liberal Democrat, and relativist, I think it's important to add, thought that you simply had to let democracy run its course. Hermann Heller thought that democracy without a degree of socioeconomic equality, social homogeneity, would not survive. So uh, um, his prescription was a, a classic social democratic response to uh, inequality. And, uh, Karl Schmidt, the third of the triumvirate, thought liberalism needed to become more authoritarian to prevent the threats to the Weimar constitution, both from the left, in fact, in Schmidt's case, especially from the left, uh, that were threatening to transcend the liberal order into what we would call something like democratic socialism. And of course, there was a big debate on the left as to whether that could be done through reform or required revolution. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, from this perspective, from Schmidt's perspective, um, the threat to the liberal order, the liberal economic order, was from democracy itself. Uh, this is very clear from his uh, Verfassungslehre. Uh, this is a quote from Schmidt's Verfassungslehre. Now, the proletariat becomes the people. This, of course, is in the context not only of growing class consciousness in the West, and, the, and universal suffrage for the first time in 1918, but with the threat of um, uh, Soviet Bolshevism, uh, not too far away either. Now the proletariat becomes the people because it is the bearer of this negativity that was Sayez, third estate, which was nothing and shall become everything. It is the part of the population which does, which does not own, which does not have a share in the produced surplus value, sounding very Marxian at this point and finds no place in the existing order. Democracy turns into proletarian democracy and replaces the liberalism of the propertied and educated bourgeoisie. This was Schmidt's fear. And from this perspective, Schmidt was a liberal. And Schmidt's rapprochement with, liberal, with liberalism, in fact, is identified, although Schmidt is orth, in orthodox story is cast as an anti-liberal, this rapprochement that Schmidt had with liberalism was identified uh, according to Renato Christie as early as 1923, which allowed him to see, Schmidt, to see that what he feared most was the incre increased pace of the democratic revolution. Okay, I won't belabor this point too much. Um, you can uh, read the, the, the materials um, yourself. I will only add uh, one, one point, which is that if we take Schmidt, seriously, which, I, which I, admittedly is, a, is, not a, is not necessarily an easy call, but if we look at his 1932 address to the German uh, uh, Langnam Verein, what becomes clear from his rhetoric is that the enemy at this point is the uh, uh, economic democracy, democratic socialism that is being advocated by 
not Hermann Heller, but the left uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Social Democrats, namely the economic democracy that was being proposed by uh, uh, Franz Neumann. So to complete the, the, the story, we have to move beyond Heller Schmidt and um, Kelsen and consider uh, a fourth interlocutor um, who I was not Neumann alone, certainly, and in fact, Sinsheimer was the labor lawyer, was perhaps a more important figure. But for, for this fourth group of more uh, radical leftists, let's say, the answer, unlike for Heller, was not more social democracy, was not a social Reichstag, a kind of paternalistic state solution, but the expansion of democracy itself. Let me just quote from uh, Ruth Duke's book, The Labor Constitution, which goes through these various uh, phases and figures in, in the interwar period. Without economic democracy as a supplement to political democracy, the vast majority of the people remained unfree, subject to the control of a minority wielding economic power. Only with economic democracy, what this means, elimination of despotism at the workplace, of the control of the markets by capital and of the state by the property classes, only then could true democracy be achieved. In other words, this would have been the continuation of the story of democracy that begins with the French Revolution, but is rapidly, of course, uh, curtailed because of the, um, uh, the historical record of what comes after. Now, this is important because it helps us to understand how the post-war reconstitution of European liberalism is already softly authoritarian. And how can I explain that? Well, in, in uh, uh, brief, because this is a much bigger story than I can explain in half an hour, the three, three dominant questions emerge after the Second World War. The first is how to prevent uh, German uh, hegemony. The second is how to avoid the returns of political extremism that were uh, multiplied through the interwar period. And thirdly, uh, how to retain economic uh, stability, how to avoid economic instability. Of course, these qu questions are complexly interrelated, but we can, for analytical purposes, attempt to separate them into three broad threads, namely how to restrain sovereignty, the response to the German question, as it were, how to restrain democracy to avoid political extremism, the, uh, the, um, the way in which state society relations are reconfigured, and thirdly, in, in uh, the attempt to uh, maintain economic stability, we have to look at the significance of the ordo liberal uh, tradition. And I'll say something about that in a moment, but would like just to pause to note that the strange feature of this combination of elements is that it is often or was often characterized in, in the literature as a form of militant democracy, which is a very strange term for a set of uh, institutional but also ideological and concrete devices that are in essence aimed at restraining democracy taming democracy. And for reasons that I will explain, I think that the, 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 the label militant democracy and even the label, even the label constrained democracy are, are misnomers. And the better way of understanding this um, uh, complex set of uh, 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 threads is through the, the label of soft authoritarian liberalism or passive authoritarian liberalism. And what do I mean by that? Well. It's explained very well. In the, uh, the German context, um, there is a sense after the Second World War that um, popular sovereignty in particular is dangerous. We are afraid of the people, not we are the people. We are afraid of the people. And this is, this is a, a, a quote taken from a German constitutional theorist, Christoph Mollers, um, in, a, in, a, in a chapter of a, of a book on constitutional theory. And he, he explains this um, very well. Now, the, the way I think that this has to be understood and to, to really to get to, to the depths of what's going on here is not merely that the elites are afraid of the people, which is certainly true, but more that the people are in some sense afraid of themselves. 
This is captured in psychosociological psycho terms, in the idea of Eric Fromm's work, Escape from Freedom. There is a sense that freedom is too much responsibility to bear for modern man. And so we retreat into the private sphere, into the, um, the one-dimensional man um, uh, uh, of the, the title of uh, Marcuse's book. Uh, we could think about Adorno's idea of the administered world, these ideas of, of, of decision-making being increasingly delegated to technocratic agencies, uh, juristic agencies, the attempt to avoid the passions of politics. All of this stuff which is uh, char uh, characterized in uh, often as part of the neoliberal period, post-democracy, uh, Chantal Mouffe talked about, of course, as Colin Crouch's term, I believe begins much, much earlier. It has a much deeper uh, lineage, which affects the, the, di the, the diagnosis, the different diagnosis also affects the slightly different prognosis. Now, this, this particular form of a fear of popular sovereignty, a fear of democracy, expresses not merely the, 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 the classical liberal sense of a, a, well, political liberal sense of a fear that the people through the tyranny of the majority may undermine a liberal democracy, but that they may undermine the liberal economy. I think this is a, a point which is neglected in legal and constitutional theory. For example, the people are left to make decisions about the economy or about the money supply, they will make irrational decisions. So we need to keep the economy safe from the people. And this, uh, 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 to exp get, capture the significance of this, we can move beyond Germany and think about the impact of this way of thinking on the European economic constitution. In some ways, the supranationalization of order liberal principles. Now we can depoliticize the economy, not only uh, uh, from the, 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 the majoritarian impulses, but from the state itself. Um, um, this is, uh, I think, captured quite nicely by um, uh, Gian Domenico uh, Maioni, who is certainly uh, no, no left-wing radical. Um, this is a quote from his book, um, uh, Rethinking the Union of Europe Post-Crisis. Uh, and he's now reflecting on the origins of the project back in the 1950s. And he says this, the possibility of separating economics and politics was a key, if implicit, assumption of the founders of the EEC, the European Economic Community. It was not a new idea, but rather a return to a classical liberal tenet, which in the 19th century and up to World War I had made it possible for the world economy to develop in such a fashion that, quote, quoting, citing the order liberal Ropka, between national and international economic integration, there was only a difference in degree, but not in kind. So this, this idea of differentiation, of separating the political from the economic in order to keep the economy safe from those irrational people has now a geopolitical separation imbued in it. And of course, one which is incredibly difficult to change because to change the treaties is incredibly difficult. This combination then of authoritarian liberalism, it's a soft authoritarianism in part because it is passively accepted in the founding decades. These, of course, are the decades that the economists refer to as the golden age or the, um, uh, the trente glorieuse, as the French call it. So there was a relatively benign set of economic circumstances, in part, of course, to do with corporatism, the power of labor, the relative power of labor and capital to come to a compromise, but not through vibrant democratization. In other words, there was this, whatever was achieved was achieved through this soft authoritarian Liberalism, And this was identified um, prior to the uh, uh, recent uh, conjuncture. Uh, this is a, an article by Kanishka Jaya Surya, uh, writing in the Southeast Asian context, um, but identifying the, the, the point of order liberalism. The order liberals have a clear conception of the political ramifications of notions of economic constitutionalism. In other words, the, um, the constitutional project which Neumann wanted to extend to the economy in the sense of making people free, not from the economy, but to uh, democratize their daily lives, is flipped over. Now the idea of the economic constitution is to keep the people away from the economy. Echoing Schmidt, um, uh, Joachim, 
uh, argued that by the end of the 19th century, the state was increasingly captured by private interest groups. This led to the politicization of the economy, which in turn weakened the state. In other words, the main purpose of economic constitutionalism was to protect the economy from these political pressures. This could not be but authoritarian. Now, of course, the older liberals, unlike the neoliberals, have a, have a much more comprehensive sense of uh, not only the dangers of democracy, but the dangers of capitalism. So there is an important caveat here, not only in the sense that order liberalism is not identical to neoliberalism, but order liberalism takes seriously the threats to the economy from unbridled capitalism, but that in either case, these threats are to be managed by a technocratic class through law, through um, experts, and so on. Now, um, what happens to all of this uh, to explain why something that was working relatively, uh, I mean, at least without uh, threats of radical rupture, we can say it was working well for some and not so well for others, but at least it wasn't really challenged in the uh, founding period. Things start to change around the time of Maastricht. And here things get a little bit complicated because we have both elements of continuity and discontinuity. We have elements of continuity of um, uh, the order liberal idea, in particular through the depoliticization of money at the, at the Maastricht lays the foundations for EMU based predominantly on order liberal assumptions, price stability, fiscal discipline, the, the German ideology, if I'm allowed to call it that. Um, but also a set of, uh, well, and so that's one continuity. Order liberalism is now extended, supranationalized to the, to the, um, uh, to the, to the domain of money. There are other continuities, and I've already explained these, um, um, post-democracy, what Meyer, Peter Meyer, the Irish political scientist, called ruling the void and increasing disconnect between the people and the, the uh, I'm going to say elites, but we can, we can use a different word if you prefer, uh, the, um, uh, how, as he describes it, as increasingly po politics is divorced from policies because policies are determined elsewhere at the, at the European level. You get politics without policies at the national level and policies without politics at the European level, you get this, you get this problematic disconnect, a, a, a void, a hollowing out of Western democracy, as he calls it. Um, so there are continuities, we might say, accelerating forms of soft authoritarian liberalism, but we also get discontinuities. Name, uh, well, not least, I suppose, the, the, uh, the reunification of Germany itself, which leads to returns of uh, uh, concerns for uh, the, the, the German question returns, um, in European politics. And I think a, a key point to lay the ground for the populism that will come later on, domestic challenges to the Euro uh, project itself, notably in the core, namely in Germany. Populism in this sense of Euroscepticism begins in the German constitutional court, not where we might expect it to have begun. Um, but this is a signal of more general uh, forms of discontent in, uh, in different countries, they take different forms. In the German case, it takes the form of constitutional challenges predominantly. Of course, now the AFD is more of a political force than simply a, a, a legal one. In, in other countries, the rise of Eurosceptic parties begins at uh, uh, this period of Maastricht. Um, now, the, 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 the uh, relationship then between authoritarian liberalism an authoritarian populism has to uh, uh, predate the, the, the current conjuncture. Now, after Maastricht, the, the hegemony of this founding period starts to falter. So in some ways, we see it accelerate. We see it accelerate through um, uh, uh, EMU, Economic Monetary Union itself. We see it accelerate through the increasing disconnect. But we also begin to see challenges to it emerging in the domestic context. You can only bottle up democracy so long before it will want to explode. And these challenges occur in various forum, 
constitutional challenges, political challenges, socioeconomic challenges, such that we can start to ask whether this dominant system begins to fail. Precisely those questions that emerge in the post-war period, how to prevent uh, German hegemony, how to prevent political extremism, how to maintain economic stability, which were thought to have been answered, return. Um, with, with question marks, because we, we still have to see where they're going. Now, what does that mean for um, the, the, the phenomenon of how we, or how we should understand the phenomenon of authoritarian populism? Well, if I'm correct uh, about um, what uh, I've just said, I think we can make a number of preliminary uh, conclusions. Firstly, the, the language of democratic decay or democratic backsliding, which is so often employed by uh, liberals, by lawyers especially, uh, to, 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 to criticize populism is deeply uh, misleading because populism is as much, if not more, an effect of democratic decay as uh, well as its cause, because of course, populism then also increases that decay, but it's not the, the cause of the decay. Populism is the effect of the democratic decay um, uh, 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 presented by soft authoritarian liberalism. The combination of uh, political authoritarianism and economic liberalism largely continues. There is a rhetorical challenge to liberalism, in the po uh, particularly the populist right, but also actually we've seen that the left ultimately didn't put up much more than a rhetorical fight. In the case of Syriza, let's see with Podemos, perhaps the same. Um, the rhetoric becomes political, politically illiberal. There is a kind of an inverse moralism because in some ways this also reflects the moralism of the liberal uh, mindset. There are rhetorical challenges but without rupture whether we're talking about Orban, Le Pis, uh, Le Pen, Salvini, these projects are being pursued without rupture, being pursued from within the existing system. They are rhetorically challenging it, but not fundamentally, materially challenging the existing order. And there is an asymmetry in this conjuncture, which is that the political right benefits from a Euroscepticism but without any serious plan to leave the EU. The left, largely caught up in the hubris of Europeanism, for good reasons, I mean, I was too, <laughs> has a reluctance to occupy the ground of Euroscepticism because of the fear of being cast as a nationalist. There is, in other words, a mutual dependency of authoritarian liberalism and authoritarian populism. For that to change, the political left would need to offer a rupture but, as I've mentioned earlier, this seems to be difficult to grasp by the, I won't say it again. Now, con to conclude, um, Roderick uh, actually has a, a fairly straightforward analysis of this, which is quite useful. And um, Roderick's trilemma, which is applied to, to uh, context of globalization, can be uh, given a European twist, and we can think about the, the, the trilemma in this way. Roderick's trilemma is to say that you can only have two, but not all three of these things. You can either have sovereignty and um, globalization or economic integration, or you can have national sovereignty and democracy, which is the, 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 the Lexit position, I say, rather than Brexit. Brexit, in fact, isn't a rupture at all. It's simply, if, the, if it's the Tory Brexit, it's, you know, it's the Singapore on Thames. It's, it's actually a continuation of the current path just outside the European Union. Or you can rejoin democracy with European integration. This is the, the, the DM uh, uh, Habermas Varoufakis plan, which is logically coherent, but suffers from uh, the deficit of implausibility, I would uh, 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 suggest. Um, and that leads to the conclusion that we are pretty much stuck with authoritarian liberalism for the foreseeable future, which is not a nice place to conclude, but nevertheless, is where I will have to finish. Thank you very much.